push out into deep water. Chapter 5 Once, when he was standing on the shore of Lake Gennesaret, the crowd was pushing in on him to better hear the word of God. He noticed two boats tied up. The fishermen had just left them and were out scrubbing their nets. He climbed into the boat that was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Sitting there, using the boat for a pulpit, he taught the crowd. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, Push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done. A huge haul of fish, straining the nets past capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I'm a sinner and can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, co-workers with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, There is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them, nets and all, and followed him. Invitation to a Changed Life One day in one of the villages, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him in prayer and said, If you want to, you can cleanse me. Jesus put out his hand, touched him and said, I want to. Be clean. Then and there his skin was smooth, the leprosy gone. Jesus instructed him, Don't talk about this all over town. Just quietly present your healed self to the priest, along with the offering ordered by Moses. Your cleansed and obedient life, not your words, will bear witness to what I have done. But the man couldn't keep it to himself, and the word got out. Soon a large crowd of people had gathered to listen and be healed of their ailments. As often as possible, Jesus withdrew to out-of-the-way places for prayer. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and religion teachers were sitting around. They had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem, to be there. The healing power of God was on him. Some men arrived carrying a paraplegic on a stretcher. They were looking for a way to get into the house and set him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, removed some tiles, and let him down in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Impressed by their bold belief, he said, Friend, I forgive your sins. That sent the religion scholars and Pharisees buzzing. Who does he think he is? That's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking and said, Why all this gossipy whispering? Which is simpler, to say, I forgive your sins, or to say, get up and start walking? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man, and authorized to do either, or both, he now spoke directly to the paraplegic. Get up, take your bedroll, and go home. Without a moment's hesitation, he did it, got up, took his blanket, and left for home, giving glory to God all the way people rubbed their eyes, incredulous, and then also gave glory to God. Awestruck, they said, we've never seen anything like that. After this, he went out and saw a man named Levi at his work, collecting taxes. Jesus said, come along with me. And he did, walked away from everything and went with him. Levi gave a large dinner at his home for Jesus. Everybody was there tax men and other disreputable characters as guests at the dinner. The Pharisees and their religion scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. What is he doing eating and drinking with crooks and sinners? Jesus heard about it and spoke up. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. They asked him, John's disciples are well known for keeping fasts and saying prayers, also the Pharisees. But you seem to spend most of your time at parties. Why? Jesus said, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine. You feast. Later you may need to pull in your belt, but this isn't the time. As long as the bride and groom are with you, you have a good time. When the groom is gone, the fasting can begin. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come. 
No one cuts up a fine silk scarf to patch old work clothes. You want fabrics that match. And you don't put wine in old cracked bottles. You get strong, clean bottles for your fresh vintage wine. And no one who has ever tasted fine aged wine prefers unaged wine. In Charge of the Sabbath Chapter 6 On a certain Sabbath, Jesus was walking through a field of ripe grain. His disciples were pulling off heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands to get rid of the chaff, and eating them. Some Pharisees said, Why are you doing that, breaking a Sabbath rule? But Jesus stood up for them. Have you never read what David and those with him did when they were hungry? How he entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar, bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat? He also handed it out to his companions. Then he said, The Son of Man is no slave to the Sabbath. He's in charge. On another Sabbath, he went to the meeting place and taught. There was a man there with a crippled hand. The religion scholars and Pharisees had their eye on Jesus to see if he would heal the man, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. He knew what they were up to and spoke to the man with the crippled hand. Get up and stand here before us. He did. Then Jesus addressed them. Let me ask you something. What kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? He looked around, looked each one in the eye. He said to the man, Hold out your hand. He held it out. It was as good as new. They were beside themselves with anger and started plotting how they might get even with him. The Twelve Apostles At about that same time, he climbed a mountain to pray. He was there all night in prayer before God. The next day, he summoned his disciples. From them, he selected twelve he designated as apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter. Andrew, his brother. James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. You're blessed. Coming down off the mountain with them, he stood on a plain surrounded by disciples and was soon joined by a huge congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem, even from the seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon. They had come both to hear him and to be cured of their ailments. Those disturbed by evil spirits were healed. Everyone was trying to touch him, so much energy surging from him, so many people healed. Then he spoke. You're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Count yourself blessed every time someone cuts you down or throws you out. Every time someone smears or blackens your name to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and that that person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Skip like a lamb if you like. For even though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My preachers and witnesses have always been treated like this. Give away your life. But it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met, and you're going to meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this. Love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. 
If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind. You be kind. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life. You'll find life given back. But not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. He quoted a proverb. Can a blind man guide a blind man? Wouldn't they both end up in the ditch? An apprentice doesn't lecture the master. The point is to be careful who you follow as your teacher. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this I know better than you mentality again, playing a holier than thou part instead of just living your own part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Work the words into your life. You don't get wormy apples off a healthy tree, nor good apples off a diseased tree. The health of the apple tells the health of the tree. You must begin with your own life-giving lives. It's who you are, not what you say or do that counts. Your true being brims over into true words and deeds. Why are you so polite with me, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing a thing I tell you? These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words, words to build a life on. If you work the words into your life, you were like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it. It was built to last. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a dumb carpenter who built a house but skipped the foundation. When the swollen river came crashing in, it collapsed like a house of cards. It was a total loss.